There are way more than just two genders, so let's take a look at the gender spectrum. This week is Transgender Awareness Week, so we thought it was a perfect time to look at gender and the gender spectrum. This way, those who don't belong to the LGBTQ community can hopefully understand gender a little more, and those in our community can better understand themselves. So let's first talk about what gender is, and then talk about the gender spectrum itself. While all humans are born with the biological characteristics of a particular sex, for example, a penis for males, vagina for females, or both genitalia for intersex, Gender, on the other hand, is a social construct. It is entirely based on the norms, behaviors, and societal roles expected of individuals based primarily on their sex. In very basic terms here, you can think of gender like this. If a person likes pink dolls and tea parties, their gender would be, in theory, female. When a person is born, doctors will look at the child and call them either a boy or a girl solely based on the genitals they have. They will even write this on their birth certificate, which for some cases is unfortunate because it's one more legal document that needs changing later in life. And while this is the definition of their sex assigned at birth, gender is completely separate from sex. And more importantly, one does not determine or define the other. That's besides the fact that gender is determined in your brain and not your genitals. As the child is taken home for the first time, they are most times put in a nursery with pink or blue paint on the walls. They're given toys to play with that are made and purchased specifically for their sex assigned at birth. Pink dolls for girls, blue toy trucks for boys, just as two examples. Later, typically around three to five years into their lives, children start having a personality of their own. This allows them to explore how they feel about things, what toys they want to play with, what colors are their favorite, and every other aspect of young life. That's why most times we see three to five year old children starting to question or realize their true gender identity. Now, oftentimes they realize their gender is the same as their sex assigned at birth. This is what we call cisgender. But a fair number of people will realize the society is wrong about them. People keep calling them a boy when they feel more like a girl deep down inside. Or people keep calling them a girl when they don't really know if they have a gender yet. As the child grows up, they become more and more in tune with how they feel deep down inside. Because as we've said before, gender is in your brain. And allowing children to question their gender and explore this a little is perfectly healthy. For example, if you want to play dress up at home, and borrow your mom, dad, or sibling's clothing to see how it feels, that's all perfectly healthy and should be completely accepted and allowed by your family and friends. Most times, closeted individuals trying to figure out their gender can find times when their parents or siblings aren't home, so they can experiment in private. Questioning things is a good thing, as it allows them to find the answers to those questions as they learn and grow into a wonderful adult in our society. But while you might see the world as a binary system of people being either boys or girls, the truth is there are millions. That's right, I said millions of gender identities. In fact, rather than listing them all here, there's a much easier way for us to describe gender. It's called the gender spectrum. Basically, it works like this. First, we draw two circles with a dot in the middle of each of them. On the top left of each circle, we have male. On the top right, we have female. On the very bottom, we have non-binary. And in the very center on that dot, we have a gender. Now, let's add some color to these wheels to help us make this more understandable, and honestly, because I'm gay and I like rainbows and colors. The left circle will be titled with perceived gender, and the right circle will be titled with actual gender. Now let's use some examples to help us with this circle chart. The first example we're going to use is myself. I am a cisgender male, which means when I was born, the doctor saw that I had a penis and gave me the sex assigned at birth of a male. The doctors, my parents, and the society I grew up in 
all defined my gender as male. So on this chart, we're going to put a marker on the perceived gender circle near the male side because everyone around me perceived my gender as male. As I grew up, I never really questioned my gender and I always felt more like a boy, a male. So my actual gender could be labeled on the same spot on the actual gender circle near the male side. And because neither of these two markers ever moved and never had to move, I am cisgender and therefore not transgender. The second example we're going to use is of a fictional person named Andy. Let's say Andy was born with a vagina. Their doctor assigned them female sex assigned at birth. So their family and everyone around them labeled them as a girl. So let's look at our chart with the two circles. Everyone perceived Andy as a girl. So we're going to put a marker on the perceived gender circle near female at the top right of the circle. But as Andy grew up, they realized they have a gender, but never felt like a boy, nor did they feel like a girl either. By definition, they would be non-binary gender. So again, let's look at our chart, this time on the actual gender circle. Their true gender was and will forever be non-binary. Now look at both of these circles at the same time, and take notice how the marker for the perceived gender is in a different place than the marker for the actual gender. So in order to help people understand that they are non-binary, Andy decides to let their hair grow out longer. They ask people to start using different pronouns to address them. Rather than people using she and her to talk about Andy, they ask people to start using they and them pronouns instead. Let's say they start dressing in more neutral clothing. Rather than wearing dresses all the time as their perceived gender would afford them, Andy decides to wear jeans and a t-shirt on some days and a skirt on other days. Because they were sex assigned at birth as a girl, they also get a binder, which is a forgiving elastic wrap placed around their chest area to hold in their breast so they don't look quite as feminine. And Andy decides to change their name to Ash. All of these are examples of socially transitioning and it's important to note here that most transgender people will only ever socially transition with zero medical transition options being chosen, which we'll cover in just a moment. It's also important to note here that all of these socially transitioning options I mentioned a moment ago are perfectly healthy and completely reversible if needed. The child is in zero harm doing any of these. But my point is, when they do any of these socially transitioning options, it helps other people's perception of their gender shift on that left perceived gender circle. In our example of Ash, formerly known as Andy, that marker on the perceived gender circle moves from the female area at the top right of the circle to the non-binary area at the bottom of the circle. The mere fact that this marker on the perceived gender circle moved from one place to another, this is called the transition, and it's where we get the term transgender from. It's imperative you understand, the actual gender marker never moved at all during Ash's life. From the moment they were born to the moment they die, they were always non-binary, or as we sometimes call it, NB which is the fanatic pronunciation of the N of non and B of binary. It was only how others perceived Ash that changed, and that change on the perceived gender circle alone is what titled them as transgender. But let's say someone decides to do more than socially transition. There are two options for them. The first is referred to as soft medical transitioning. This includes speaking with a gender therapist and their doctor, who both have to sign off on them to get what's called a puberty blocker, which basically postpones their body's puberty. This can be a fantastic thing for transgender children. Then, after years of going to gender therapy and being on this puberty blocker, a child can finally move on to the next step. Legally, in the United States and many other countries, the next step cannot begin until the child is 16 years of age or older with parent or guardian's permission, consent from a licensed psychiatrist, and consent from their doctor. Finally, when all of those stars align, a child can finally start on what's called hormone treatment. 
This is a drug to help the appropriate hormones thrive in their bodies. These hormones and puberty blocker drugs are proven to help the child overcome depression and body issues. It helps them in so many ways. But to better understand this, let's put it against our charts. Let's use the fictitious example of a child named Leslie. She was born with female genitals, and so doctors assigned her at birth with female. Thus, her family and friends all perceived her gender as female. And on this perceived gender circle, we'd put the marker near the female side on the upper right of the circle. But at just four years old, Leslie started to question her gender. She started not wanting to wear dresses all the time and wanted to play with the boys on the playground instead of other girls. Finally, when she was just eight years old, her parents decided to take her to a gender therapist to help her understand her gender more. The gender therapist and Leslie both figured out that her actual gender was male. And so on the actual gender circle, we'd put our marker on the male side of the circle in the upper left. Leslie started to socially transition by dressing only in male clothing, asking everyone to start using he and him pronouns, changing his name to Larry, cutting his hair shorter, and so on. Usually these steps of socially transitioning are not only to help the child, but to help the doctors and therapist determine if the child will truly be happy with the gender they are transitioning to. Slowly, the marker on the perceived gender circle started to move from the female side to the male side. Eventually, when he was 10 or 11 years old, the gender therapist and his doctor started talking and prescribing him puberty blockers. This helped Larry's self-esteem, and the doctors started to notice that his depression started to go away. When he turned 16 years old, his parents, the doctor, and gender therapist all agreed this was the right call to make, so they prescribed Larry a hormone treatment. It was just a simple patch he put on, but it helped Larry develop some facial hair and so on. And luckily for Larry, the marker on the perceived gender circle eventually moved all the way from the female side to the male side to match his actual gender marker. It was here where Larry felt a sense of gender euphoria, knowing everyone around him accepted his true gender identity, and now he was being perceived as his authentic self for the first time in his life. But there is another type of medical transition though, and it's referred to as a hard transition. In very basic terms, you can think of this as surgery, but it's important to note here that by law in most countries of the world, including the United States, no one can undergo gender-affirming surgery until they have already completed socially transitioning and soft medical transitioning, which means the child has to be of 17 years or older in order to even consider hard transition here. The person needs to be on hormones for a minimum of a year. The now 17-year-old is then allowed, with parent or guardian consent, the doctor and gender therapist permission as well, to talk about gender-affirming surgery. Because of the tens of thousands of dollars it cost, and the medical risk involved in surgery, many transgender people only ever socially transition, or at the very most, go on hormones. Even if they don't have parental support for their gender identity, as they should have, they must turn 18 years of age or older by law and then start the whole process at that point. So even if you hear the myth that doctors are doing surgery on little kids to change their gender, it is simply not true. But to better understand hard medical transition, let's look at a real world example here of a woman named Christine George Jensen. She was from New York in the United States, was drafted into World War II and later became a household name after the war ended. Christine was born with male genitals, so her doctors, her parents, and society perceived her as a boy. So on our chart, we would put a marker on the perceived gender circle near the male side. But truly, Christine always felt more like a girl. In interviews she did later in life, she told the press stories from her childhood and how it never felt right for her to be called a boy. So her actual gender is labeled on the right side of the second circle on our chart. You'll notice how the markers, in comparison, are now on different sides of the circle. 
So let's dive deeper into Christine's life to learn more. When she returned home from the war as a soldier, she traveled to the country of Denmark and underwent several gender-affirming surgeries called top and bottom surgeries. This allowed her to look and feel more like a woman by giving her breast and, in a highly complex surgery we won't dive too deeply into today, giving her a vagina. When she returned to the United States, she was on the cover of every newspaper, magazine, and interviewed by several TV stations for being the first widely known transgender woman to receive these surgeries. But getting back to our chart here, everyone in her life knew her as a boy, before and even during the war. Suddenly, she had surgeries to help others perceive her as a woman, and thus the marker for how others perceived her gender moved on our chart from everyone perceiving her as a boy to everyone perceiving her as a woman. This finally gave her gender euphoria, to have both her perceived gender and actual gender circles match perfectly. I would like to note here, there are tons of different gender identities we cannot cover because of time constraints. For example, someone could be gender fluid and their actual gender identity moves constantly on the spectrum. Demigender means someone feels a partial connection to multiple genders on the spectrum at the same time, so their marker is somewhere between. And agender means someone doesn't feel like they have a gender at all, and would therefore be marked in the direct center of the spectrum circle. Before we end the lesson though, I want to quickly point out that no matter how far someone goes, it doesn't make their gender identity any less valid. Let's say a child doesn't have accepting parents at home, so they can't go to a gender therapist, nor can they get puberty blockers, or hormones, or surgery, because their parents or legal guardians won't sign off on the first step in that very long process. It does not in any way mean their actual gender identity is any less valid. It just means they have horrible and transphobic parents. In fact, in these situations, it puts the child at a much higher risk of suicide and depression because they cannot get the help they need to affirm their gender. So what we always suggest is for teachers and school administrators to affirm their gender in school. Friends should address them by their chosen name and pronouns online or away from their family members and so on. But from all of us here at Power Rainbows, happy Trans Awareness Week. If you want to learn more about transgender lessons, watch interviews with trans experts, and so on, be sure to check out this playlist right here. If you want to learn more about LGBTQ topics, then hit subscribe for weekly episodes. I am Professor Pride. Have a gay day, everyone, and as always, trans lives matter.